Jazz has always been himself. He's never shied away from being who he is, being in addition to the, to the freak athlete that he is, just being outspoken, being unapologetically himself. That's Jazz being Jazz. That's what he said. Uh, Jazz Chisholm was on The Pivot and had comments about the early Marlins days for him. And then he actually had more comments since then. But let's start with this little soundbite, and then we'll bring on a guest to help us out on this matter. Like, you ain't supposed to have a vet that's trying to bring down the rookies, bro. Yeah. Like, I was that guy that got in trouble so much because when I saw other rookies getting bring down by the vets, I was the one fighting the vets. That was the problem. Like, I was already a team leader without being called a team leader. But the vets, you can't be a team leader when you got guys in the clubhouse that's been in there for nine, ten years. Even though they suck, <laughs> they've been there for nine, ten years. Yeah. And the team calls them the team captain, but, like, they're not a good captain. They're not a good person. You're not even a good athlete at this point. Yeah. You're just here. Yeah. And you're bringing down the young guys that are supposed to be good, bro, like, I watched someone get called up to the big leagues, supposed to be like top three prospects on our team, right? He gets up there, hits a homer. Like first, sex, first or second at bat hits a homer, right? His next at bat, he goes and does the Juan Soto shuffle, right? Like he's a kid. His favorite player is Juan Soto. He just got to the big leagues. Tell me why he comes in the dugout after, he, he walks, get around the base, comes in the dugout after, these vets sit on the side of him and start yelling at him, saying, bro, you're not Juan Soto, bro. You shouldn't be doing that. Juan Soto is an all-star, da 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 You can't be doing that. Bro, what do you mean? He's having fun, bro. We playing a fucking kid's games. Yeah. Like, that's when I step in and say, bro, y'all better back up off this boy, bro. This man is starting. He's playing every day for us. Why are y'all in his face? Y'all don't even play every day. Yeah. What's up? Like, <laughs> get, off, get off my man, bro. He's supposed to be helping us win when y'all bringing him down. Yeah. And then after that, 0 for 50, 30 some strikeouts. Dang. <laughs> He's talking to football players. They're like, I haven't watched a baseball game. In my yeah, life. they're like, what's, <laughs> what's a strikeout? <laughs> I had so many follow ups, and they're just like, uh, what sport do you play? Uh, anyway, we talk baseball all First day of long. all, before we get into, before we get to our next, was it, he's talking about Nick Fortes? I mean, I don't know. That's what I was assuming he's talking about the you're guy. talking about Mickey Rowe. No, but he's saying Nick Fortes, the oh. kid who hit the homer and then went like, remember there was a big thing where he hit the homer, they showed his family in the crowd, and they were all excited, da da da, da and then he like fell off the earth. I don't know. Let's well, ask, let's let's ask, ask our guest. Yeah. He, he comes from the Miami Herald and covers this team every day, and there's been more comments since Jordan McPherson is on the screen and with us now. Jordan, your thoughts on all the spice that Jazz is bringing over the past 24 hours? Yeah, it's been very interesting to say the least. Obviously, we knew about some fractions, especially a couple years back when they had that big team. They had one of their big team meetings in, I believe it was back in 2022, where there were differences between how some of the veterans were thinking about how things need to go, how the younger guys thought things were supposed to be go supposed to go. Um, we knew Jazz was at the set, was in part of it one way or the other. Obviously, depending on who you talk to, would determine which side of the narrative he's on, but Jazz has always been himself. He's never shied away from being who he is, being in addition to the, to the freak athlete that he is, just being outspoken, being unapologetically himself. And that's what we're seeing there. Whether, again, it was that's Jazz being Jazz. I don't know all the specifics about some of the instances that he brought up, especially in the full podcast, but I knew there have been some, there were some, differences of opinions in that clubhouse, especially over, especially back to those couple or those early years in jazz are 2021, 2022. Okay. So listen, if you're, if I'm jazz and I'm going on this show, I know he named Mickey Rojas, which everything I've heard about Mickey Rojas, he's incredible. So, and again, I'm not picking sides here, Mickey Rojas, jazz Chisholm, but like, he's like, Oh, these veteran guys said this name, their names. Like you're, you're calling dudes out, name them. Tell the guy who hit the home run and then went 0 for 50 with 30 strikeouts. Like, don't say this and be like, oh, well, now I'm like, you're, you're calling yourself a leader. Well, then lead and call dudes out and say, this isn't the way we do it. Don't. And then he fought guys. Like, who'd he fight? Cause you didn't hear, I didn't hear about him fighting anybody. Did you hear about him fighting anybody? Like, that seems to me like, Hey jazz, like you're fighting guys. Like let's, let's hear about it. 
Yeah, no, I never heard of any of that stuff. And on the Miggy Rowe side, he was, at least from the media perspective, Miggy Rowe was always available. Miggy Rowe was always, at least externally, one of the one of the leaders, especially in those day, the dog days of that team, 2019 when they were 105 lost team, uh, 2020 when they had to go through everything with the pandemic and COVID early. Miggy Rowe made himself go from one of a utility guy to being a voice in a clubhouse that needed a voice, and yeah, on that's on the stuff with Jazz. You're right. Here weren't again. It was a lot of this happened, this happened, this happened, but no real clarity as to again, like you said, no names were called. There are people. There are people who were in there who could assume that there are going to be name. That can assume who the names are if you've been around the clubhouse. But I'm not. I, since I wasn't in there, I'm not I'm putting my two cents in there because I have an idea of who he's talking about. But I'm not 100 percent for sure who he's referring to in a few of those instances. But yes, you're right. If he's going to go out on that point, if you're going to go halfway, you've got to go all the way on that front. Jordan, you've covered this team for a while. Do you think that was holding them back or is it roster construction? Because that can bring us up to now where generally people get along much more um, when they're winning and there's much more beef when there is losing baseball. So the Marlins have had a lot of losing in their past. Um, Besides last year when they were a playoff team, they didn't do a lot this off season. So hopes are not high and their pitching staff is decimated. Yeah. uh, I mean, the clubhouse rapport in the last couple of years, again, you could see everybody interacts with each other. You never really see any negativity or pointing fingers. And honestly, at least from the time that I'm in the clubhouse, even in those early years, I started in 2019, that 105 loss season. You never really saw finger pointing inside the clubhouse, at least when the media was allowed in there. So I think it's also, it comes down to, in addition to the clubhouse rapport, just how everybody, the camaraderie in between the clubhouse and also the direction from the people directly above them. By that, I'm talking about Skip Schumacher. You saw just in one year how he was able to infuse confidence in a team that maybe last year, didn't wasn't warranting the confidence of being told at the beginning of the year, hey, you can be a playoff team. If you guys execute your potential, even if things aren't going right, you can win the game today. And Skip Schumacher's demeanor throughout from the very start gave this team an understanding of what it takes to not only win, but also to be to win as a team and throw your individual stats aside, throw your individual accomplishments aside and find a way to rally as one. And you saw it last year. Things didn't go perfect last year. Sandy Alcantara underperformed and ended up missing a year. And now he's out this year with Tommy John. You saw some, you saw, again, Jazz only played 90 some games. Their big hitters didn't, the big hitters, the guys who they signed that offseason, Gene Segura, Johnny Cueto, hoping that they could make an impact, didn't. And this team still found a way to win all those close games, win, be winning, winning one run games, winning a bunch of walk offs, and showing that they were able to compete. So I think. When you look at it from that perspective, that also that dynamic also helped change some things in that clubhouse. Jordan, um, let's get a little more positive here. I know kind of the jazz thing is kind of a, a weird sentence, but I love Skip Schumacher. W- what are the positives coming out of Marlins camp? I know you've wrote an article about Sixto, who was supposed to be like unbelievable, hurt his shoulder. He's what, three years out, I think, now since he's pitched last. Obviously, El Garcia, we showed the, the tweet. Are these the two biggest surprises in Marlins camp so far? is the fact that Sixto's got a chance to make the roster and Avisel Garcia's back healthy, ready. I think it's his free agent year, so back ready to have a big year. Yeah, uh, obvious two years left on his deal, so not free agent year yet. But Sixto, for me, is hands down, far and away, the biggest story from this camp. So, I mean, I was here. I got to see his debut in 2020 during that COVID year and just the swagger, the demeanor, on top of having three or four really good pitches that can just light up any opponent to see him go from there to just the three years of struggles that have followed going from two separate shoulder surgeries. Every time it seems like he's about to take the next step, he has another setback and just knowing that this year was basically do or die for him for the simple fact that he's out of options. So he basically has to make the team this year and he came in confident hit the first day of spring training. He said to us, this is going to be my year. And so far through spring, he looks like the 6 of old. Uh, his fastball is still hitting the upper 90s. His changeup is still arguably the one of the best pitches I've seen. And he's not going to be a starter. He's most likely going to be a multi-inning reliever. 
go to, be able to go two to three innings, but just the fact that they're able to find a way to utilize him and get some value out of him after three years of waiting and hoping for something to happen. It's, it's remarkable to say the least. And you see the swagger, you see the confidence in him. Every when he walks out to the mound, he's doing his little shimmy. He's doing, he's looking down hitters. Like, I know I'm going to beat you. And he's just fine. He's just building that confidence back up that he had back in that debut year in 2020. As for obviously Garcia, he knows he needs to produce this year. First two years with the Marlins, again, he's making about $12 million a year, and injuries and underperformance just made him almost useless those first two years. He spent this offseason working a lot with Luis Arise down in Miami. They've been swinging together. He's been working with Luis Arise's hitting coach. And just from watching how he's looking, in addition to his body looking great and him losing weight, he's – his swing, he's basically trying to mimic Luis Arise's swing, but with obviously El Garcia power. If he's able to combine those two, and with the way their lineups are constructed, he's probably going to be batting 6th, 7th, 8th. So if he can be 80% of what he was before he's at Miami, batting in the, toward the bottom third of the lineup, that just gives them an extra piece down down deep in that lineup that's going to be able to, to help them lengthen out, lengthen out their 1 through 9. Fans connect to players. They connect to players that are organizational players, free agents, all that stuff. How can fans connect to ownership in Miami when they go out and make one tiny splash the entire offseason after they brought in a new manager who led them? I know a lot of one-run games, people say lucky, with a beleaguered lineup to the playoffs. How can the fans in Miami get behind this ownership because that's who's going to be here longer, way longer than any of these players, any star player they bring up. No, you're completely right. And that's been the ongoing question for, well, Bruce Sherman's here. This is seventh year. It's been going on for seven years now. It's basically, it's, they always say, we're going to invest in the team. We're going to invest money. We're not going to be payroll strapped, this, that, the other. The words are nice, but the actions need to be shown, whether it's going out and getting more than just one free agent in a Tim Anderson. It's, proving that you're willing to dedicate yourselves and be able to and keep the guys you want who want to be here long term. Luis Arise being the biggest example of that. He has this year and next year, he has said three or four different times since the offseason that he wants to be in Miami. Peter Bendix and P general manager Peter Bendix or president of baseball operations Peter Bendix and Prince Wilmer Bruce Sherman have both said we want players who want to be in Miami to stay in Miami. Well, Luis Arise has said it. You guys are saying you want him. Why have there not been talks? Why is there not at least a dis an open forum or an open discussion between them? If you want the fans to commit to you, you need to commit to the players that they want to see, whether it's a Luis Arias or eventually down the road a Jazz Chisholm Jr. or find or making a big splash in free agency. They need to do something outside of just saying, yes, we are open to doing it. If you're open to doing it and there is and there is mutual interest, you need to get something done, anything. Or keep the general manager in there, Kim Eng, who did a yeah, bang-up job with zero cash. And now the new GM comes in, and we're hearing all offseason, Jesus Lazardo was on the trade block. We haven't heard as much about it now. Do you think that was real? Is it still going on if you think that was real? Or is that just like, hey, there's a bunch of cool pitchers out there. We want to see if we can get some value for this guy, too. Yeah, I don't think the Jesus Lazardo trade talks were as real as it see as it came off. Just because of the fact that without Sandy Alcantara, if you're gonna say that you're trying to compete and build off a playoff run, Jesus Lazardo was your their clear cut number one. There's no way that they could justify to the fans specifically that if they're gonna compete, but also ship off their top pitcher in the process of doing that. A few of the other guys were Cabrera. Uh, even if they went further down the line with Trevor Rogers, Braxton Garrett, those could be justifiable with at least heading in the spring with the number of arms they had behind them. But Jesus Lazardo was almost always going to be their guy this year. And again, just the story what they have with how he's developed over here. He essentially became their ace last year, especially after Sandy missed the final month of the season. They knew he was going to be their number one. It was figuring out how two through five behind him were going to pan out. And whether that meant having to deal one of their guys to try to get that if they didn't get a Tim Anderson or just going with what they had, I was would have been absolutely shocked if some way Lazaro got dealt over over the offseason. 
Jordan, how was camp now that we're towards the end of it? I know you mentioned some of the individual players. What about from a front office perspective, kind of playing off what you just said? Is the ultimate goal here, we want to replicate the Rays as best as possible in every way possible, maybe with even a slightly lower payroll than Tampa Bay ultimately? It seems like they're kind of redoing what they have behind the scenes and I guess also somehow can't do that while also adding to a roster that some thought was in their win now mode after a pretty tough tanking situation since they traded John Carlos Stanton back in the day and the rest of that team was disbanded like JT Real Muto and Christian Yelich and many others. So is that what the plan is? Like let's reset on the back end, then we'll reset the player personnel and maybe we'll be a championship team in 2032. Oh <laughs> uh, well, the way that I see, I saw everything. I knew that when Pierre Bendix walk came in, just like almost every other new head of baseball operations, whether it's general manager or president of baseball operations, what have you, they want to have, they want to create their own flavor. They want to be able to set their own. They want to set create their own identity. And Peter's entire career has been with the Rays. He knows he's watched and had a hand in how they've established themselves, created their success with the low payroll. The Marlins, in a sense, before he even came here, tried to establish that, but not to the full extent of the Rays. And when I talked with Peter back over the offseason, he was basically playing it off of they need to build the infrastructure so that their future is secure, while also keeping an eye on how they can at least hold water with what they did last year in the present. And his philosophy, especially this season, with the way the fact that they had a lot of their guys coming back was – he wasn't going to overspend on free agency just because of the way that the Marlins are financially at this point. The return of interest, he'd be able to get a lot more benefit from trades than from free agency. That's why they didn't do much. That's at least that's the logic that was explained publicly. So they're trying to do the trying to tow both lines with the be, make sure we're secure for the future while also doing what we can in the present, but. Marlins fans have been hearing that for we're on year 31. Now I think they've been hearing that for basically most of the franchise history. They're trying, but I understand where a new guy coming in and wanting to create his own identity is going to take that first year to create his identity, even if things were going well before. So we'll see how it all plays out. But this team, it's has a chance to do sort of, I feel I'm saying this throughout camp that, this team, if thing, I said last year, if things go right, the Marlins would be a 500 team. They obviously things did not go completely right, and they were still above 500 team. I'm feeling basically the same way about this team this year that they'll, if things go their way, they could be competing for third in the East. Which, if you're competing for third in the East, that's gives you a chance to be competing for potentially one of those last two wild card spots. Yeah, it's a good point. And I obviously brought it up with some sarcasm because I lived for a while in Miami and I have friends that are pissed and many that grew up there and spent their whole life, right? Many people, especially in their 30s, 40s, 50s that were Marlins fans, embraced the team from the jump. And they're like, yo, we hear the same thing, like you said, for three decades plus. It's so tired. Now we have to wait again for a new process in a division that includes the Phillies, Braves and Mets when they bounce back. Okay, but... Yeah, I'm with you. There's some bright spots, but this was the time to capitalize. Jordan, great to have you on, man. Appreciate the time, and uh, we'll catch you soon, okay? All right. Thanks so much, you guys. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. We're back here every weekday, all year long, so do not miss an episode. The videos are coming in all day. Here's another video you might enjoy. Baseball, the way it should be covered.